Good afternoon. My name is David Fries, and this is the BISA webinar. And for those of you who regularly watch different venue today, I'm up in Penrith. Uh, I've got three screens. I'm sitting down for the first time. What could possibly go wrong? We're talking about the carbon reduction code today, uh, a really exciting topic. Um, and uh, first, I'd like to introduce our first guest, Dr. Jennifer Schooling, OBE, who is the director for the Centre for Smart Infrastructure and Construction at the University of Cambridge. Welcome, Jennifer. I can't hear you, unfortunately. Oh, there you are. Um, so, are you actually in Cambridge, Jennifer? I'm living in. I live in Newmarket, just outside Cambridge. So, uh, almost, but not quite. Uh, I have a good friend who uh, is at Godolphin Stables just in uh, there. Correct, yes. And I um, I actually live opposite, not their folding unit, but one of the other folding units. So I get to look uh, out of it. New uh, folds. Can't be that. Yeah, well, I was looking at your wallpaper when we were doing the sort of warm up. That very interesting wallpaper behind you. Is there some story behind that? The, um, yes. the, the dandelions or the. The dandelions. Dandelions. I just was bored of having a plain white wall behind me. So I bought a transfer and then spent a couple of hours getting drowned by it because it comes as one massive plastic sheet that you have to sort of manage to get onto the wall. So, <laughs> so we're going to be talking about carbon reduction today in net zero uh, and we both had to remind each other that we're running a poll before we start. So if Charlie you could run the poll, it's just to test where people are in the audience today and then we'll go straight into your presentation. So the poll is to what extent is carbon reduction management an active part of your organization's core objectives is it very strong strong moderate weak don't really know so if you can tick your boxes as soon as we've done that we will move on to the presentation itself we just give that a few seconds so you're actually based in the university of cambridge Yes, that's correct. Yeah, but the organisation that I run, the Centre for Smart Infrastructure and Construction, is um, a collaborative research centre in the engineering department in Cambridge. But we work with other parts of the university and other universities indeed. Uh, and for this project, close links to the CLC. Yes. Yeah. So um, we have very strong links with industry as part of CSIC, um, and I'll talk a little bit about this. But um, it was one of our industry groups that um, felt the need to draft the code, and then we brought it in under CLC's EGIS because it fit very well with the um, Construction Zero initiative that they're running as well. Great. Well, we've got over 80% of people have now voted. So I think, Charlie, we'll call it a day there. Uh, and we'll go straight to your presentation, Jennifer, and I'll come back in at the end for Q&A. Great, thanks. See you later. Charlie, if you can give me permission to share. Brilliant, okay. And hopefully now, can people see my slides? Yes, perfect. Thanks, Charlie. So um, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much to BESA for inviting me to come and talk today about the carbon reduction code built environment. I'm going to talk for about 15 or 20 minutes about um, the need for the code, how we develop the code, and what's in the code. Um, as David pointed out, it's comes under the Construction Leadership Council and their Construct Zero initiative, uh, which is very much about driving, in their case, the construction industry, but we really think about not just the construction industry and the code, but the whole built environment, um, but driving towards um, a net zero um, economy. And my organisation is the Cambridge Centre for Smart Infrastructure and Construction, <clears throat> also known as CSIC. Um, so, what about carbon emissions? Well, obviously the UK government in 2019 was the first national government, I think, to um, put into law that we would be at net zero by 2050. Now that is a very laudable aim and hats off to Theresa May for doing that. However, if we do a linear reduction between 2019 and 2050 um, of carbon, then that isn't fast enough to avoid one and a half degrees centigrade of warming. And current emissions are exceeding our carbon budget. And this is an issue because carbon dioxide persists in the atmosphere for 100 to 200 years. So the more we put up now, the less of our budget we have left between now and 2050. And that carbon has a radiative forcing effect. So every tonne of carbon that we emit today will be there for another couple of centuries heating the planet. 
Um, so we really need to save as much carbon as possible as early as possible. And in order to do that, we have to make as much headway as we can right now with existing technologies. It is obviously also important to be researching new technologies and new approaches, um, but we've got to do everything that we possibly can with what we have around us now, because we don't have time to wait for those new technologies to come online. So this was um, a lot of the motivation for the development of the carbon reduction code for built environment. Um, those of you who have come across documents like PAS 2080, which is a publicly available specification for um, managing carbon in infrastructure projects, um, will be familiar with this um, sort of construction pyramid. And really what we have to do is to think about deciding what we need to build, if anything, if we are building things, how we should build them and with which materials and approaches. Um, so the best thing to do actually is to avoid building at all. Is there another solution to building something new? Can we manage our existing assets and get more out of them as we have them now? If we do have to build, can we build less? And if we do have to build, can we build clever? So can we use materials with a lower capital carbon to reduce the, the amount of carbon we're emitting in creating our, our assets? And then finally, um, can we build efficiently? Can we use less material and, and reduce waste in the construction process? Now, all of these things also apply to retrofit um, and management and maintenance. And I realise that a lot of the audience today will be more involved in the management and maintenance and operation of um, building assets than in the construction of them. But I think it's worth sort of looking at the capital carbon as well as the operational carbon. The other thing, and this is relevant to everybody, is that we have to take a whole life perspective on things that we're building, things that we're operating and things that we're maintaining. Our built environment is a complex system of systems. You know, it's comprised of transportation, it's comprised of energy, it's comprised of buildings, it's comprised of water supply and wastewater systems um, and so on and so on and so on. It includes social infrastructure as well as economic infrastructure. So our hospitals, our schools, our houses. Um, and all of those things interact with each other in a very complex way. And crucially, once we've built something, it usually persists for many decades, if not centuries. So our sort of social infrastructure and our homes and indeed our commercial infrastructure all last for decades. You know, buildings typically last for decades, homes often last for centuries. And certainly the, the big economic infrastructure, so the transport infrastructure, water, wastewater and so forth, they often persist for centuries. So network rail um, manages and manages 28,000 bridges, of which about half were built before 1914, um, and they're still in use. So we really do have to think about what we're building and how long it will be useful. So how long will this asset be used for? We're creating more embodied carbon now, save carbon over the life cycle. Now, obviously, if you're building something that lasts 200 years, that's one thing. Some buildings, like commercial office buildings, however, they're built with a, a life of 60 years, but often they're torn down after 20 or 30 years because the market needs change. So if, if a building is likely to be torn down earlier, then it may well not be worthwhile investing capital carbon to save operational carbon. That said, how can we make the use of any of our physical assets more energy efficient? We need to think about that all the time, both in the design and in the operation and in the retrofit of them. And how can we make these assets easier to maintain and more carbon efficient to maintain? So how can we reduce the amount of material that's required for maintenance activities, for example? So all of these things are really important when we're thinking about our um, reducing our carbon footprint. And crucially, we can only know that we are reducing our carbon footprint if we are able to measure our carbon footprint um, at all stages in the life cycle of the um, design, construction and use of any physical asset. Um, and it's not just me that says that, Lord Kelvin said it back in 1883 and far be it for me to contradict him. So in that case, what we really need to do is think about learning from real performance. So as far as design goes, we need to calculate and optimize the carbon in the design process. Importantly, we need to calibrate uh, design models against real performance. Now this is as true of um, the um, HVAC systems, for example, in a building, as it is of the, if you like, the, the kind of physical infrastructure of the building, the, the, the bricks and mortar. Um, so we need to understand how the things that we are designing actually perform in reality. Um, we need to control our processes on construction sites or in factories. We need to use the relevant standards. So for construction, that's past 2080. Um, and we need to monitor and manage our waste in construction and our energy in use. Um, we need to assess and declare the actual embodied carbon of things that we build, and that includes all of the waste 
um, that's generated as part of the, the process of creating something. Um, we need to measure, monitor and reduce the operational carbon of all of these things. Then we need to invest in innovations to improve the performance and we need to measure it again to check that those innovations have improved the performance and we need to learn fast. So some innovations won't work, that's the nature of innovation. We have to be prepared to fail, but to fail fast and to recognise failure, um, learn from it and move on. Um, and it's crucial that we do this as quickly as we can. So this led um, a group of us to look at the, developing a carbon reduction code for the built environment, which I'm going to now spend the rest of this presentation talking about. Um, it really is just a first step to facilitate action by all the relevant parties towards reducing carbon, carbon emissions. It's not intended to replace PAS 2080 or the relevant standards um, it, at all. In fact, it refers to them. Um, but it is a framework for organisations to make a public commitment and to report progress, crucially, on um, their path to net zero. And it comes in three parts. Core commitments for all organisations, commitments for client organisations and commitments for supply chain organisations. Um, some organisations may only see themselves able to commit to the core commitments. So a lot of the supply chain stuff is actually for some of the bigger uh, tier one type organisations. But I'll talk you through that in just a moment. But before I get into the detail of the code, I just wanted to say a few words about its development. Um, as you know, I come from an academic organisation, although I used to work in industry. So I just wanted to reassure you that this wasn't cooked up by a bunch of crazy academics um, sitting in their ivory towers. It was actually drafted by our Achieving Net Zero Industry Working Group, which is a group of over 30 professionals who came together for a roundtable um, just as the pandemic started back in March 2020. So we, the first event we did online. Um, and it was intended to be a one-off event, but what emerged from the event was a real desire from these people to keep getting together to look at how we can make real progress in carbon reduction. Because there was a feeling that there's lots of good words around and lots of good ambition, but it's very hard to know what you can actually practically do. Um, so we developed the carbon reduction code for the built environment um, and we trialled it with the National Association of Construction Frameworks, the Environment Agency and Skanska, and two of the people um, involved in those trials, Peter Yates from NACF and um, Chris Hayes from Skanska are on this webinar today and we'll be telling you a little bit about why they got involved later on. Crucially, it's aligned with and supported by the Construct Zero initiative, as I mentioned, and it also aligns with the UK government's procurement policy note, PPN 621, what an exciting name, which is all about carbon reduction in procurement. So um, what we very much wanted to do was to make sure that this wasn't Yet another thing that people had to think about, but that it was very much aligned with these other things and complying with the code helps you comply with them and vice versa. So what does the code look like? Um, we have, as I said, two core commitments for all organisations. Now, the first one is an aim. It's not, people aren't necessarily going to manage to achieve it, but we felt it was important to have a challenging aim. So this is deliberately a stretch target. But the aim is to reduce direct and indirect emissions by 75% by 2030 in order to meet zero carbon emissions by 2045 or the relevant government date if that, if that becomes earlier. So the reason for saying 75% by 2030 is, you know, as I mentioned before, the more carbon we emit now, the less we have in our budget. So we really have to make as rapid progress as possible as quickly as possible. In some sectors, it's going to be very hard to get to 75%. But I think if we have the ambition to try and do it, then we will, we, some of us will get there, some of us will exceed it, and all of us will get substantially further than if we're not trying to do that. So that is an aim. Um, and in signing up to the code, organisations commit to trying to do that. And then the second key commitment is to set out plans to meet net zero by 2045. Now, the reason it's 2045, not 2050, is because this is a whole UK um, um, code and the Scottish government has set into law 2045 as their date to meet net zero. So we've gone with 2045. So we'll set out our plans to meet net zero by 2045, including annual targets and recognising that the majority of cuts will need to be made by 2030. And importantly, the organisations signing up will publish their plans and their progress against it annually. So those are the two key commitments. And the thing about the second commitment is it's measurable. Um, so we wanted to make sure that anything that was being done uh, was, was not just a, a commitment to do good things, but to evidence that good things are attempting to be done. 
And then we have the, the rest of the commitments. Now, apologies that this slide is, is quite small, but um, there's a link in the chat to the, um, the code page on our CSIC website. Uh, so you can download the code and have a look at it. Um, and the details of the, the other um, commitments are, are in there. So there's, there's two sections, as I said earlier. There's commitments for clients um, and there's commitments for the supply chain. And with the clients, it's very much about doing the right things in procurement. So including carbon reduction targets and reporting commitments in procurement documents as a deliverable of the procurement process. Um, and that's specifically to um, move the sort of cost carbon balance in favour of carbon. Often when we're looking at carbon reduction, it comes at an in initial upfront cost and the, the sort of the, 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 the cost seesaw, the cost carbon seesaw often falls in favour of the, the cost over the carbon. So we're trying to shift that balance so that carbon reduction becomes an important part of um, all procurement processes. And we make specific reference to um, including capital carbon according to the quantification framework of PAS 2080 and using PAS 2080 or the relevant standard um, as the reference document. Um, the, the, the second core commitment is around providing a carbon baseline for each project and setting carbon targets for carbon reduction against those over the process of a project to drive innovation. Again, sometimes procurement gets in the way of um, good innovations happening during a project. So the idea is that not only will we procure against carbon reduction targets, but we will commit to encouraging the supply chain um, and facilitating the supply chain being able to innovate around carbon during the process of a project. And also to having carbon data externally verified as part of reporting requirements via an appropriate um, standard again. So those are the core commitments for clients. There are then some further commitments um, which are not a requirement for signing up to the code but which are um, if you like part of good citizenship and they are very much around collaborating together both among clients and with the supply chain um, to move forward the pace of carbon reduction so it includes providing the supply chain with outcome-based specifications as part of procurement it includes having in place a carbon data set so if one does not emerge from national initiatives then um, we will aim to put for the clients to come together to try and develop um, a carbon data set. And it, it includes committing to sharing data in that carbon data set. So that, that gives you a flavor of the, the client commitments. Then the supply chain commitments, and excuse me, I'll have to look across to my second screen here to read them. Um, core commitments for the supply chain are to automate production and delivery of carbon information through design and construction using integrated approaches to data creation and management um, and to reduce the carbon intensity of projects year on year. Then to proactively recommend and adopt carbon measurement and carbon reduction methodologies in all product projects, um, regardless of whether the client is asking for them. So this is about the supply chain pushing clients as well as, the, you know, on, on the other page, we've got the clients sort of pulling the supply chain. Um, and a commitment to work in close collaboration with clients and with supply chain partners to deliver on the client's carbon requirements. So really taking a proactive approach around this, working with clients where the client's calling for it um, and really collaborating together to do as much as possible to make real progress in carbon reduction. Um, and then the, the sort of further commitments again are all about collaboration and helping each other along. So um, for contractors, particularly tier one contractors, there's a commitment to proactively support, support the supply chain to adopt carbon measurement and carbon reduction um, and to require them to report on carbon. Now that reflects the fact that, you know, obviously for big organisations, there is, there is resource around to commit to developing carbon reduction methodologies and so forth. For some of the smaller organisations, this can be quite hard because you know, if you've only got a small number of people in your organisation, it, it's hard to allocate someone to thinking about carbon full time. So what we want to do is make sure that there's a collaborative approach in the supply chain to help smaller organisations or organisations who are only just starting out on their carbon reduction journey to make progress and to learn from what others are doing. Um, there's also the commitment again to, to contribute to, um, to contribute to a carbon reduction data to a publicly available carbon measurement database. Um, again, if there, if there isn't one being supplied, being sort of set up by the government, then we'll seek to do that at an industry level. Um, consultants commit to working with clients to consider carbon hierarchy options, that, that pyramid that I talked about earlier, um, before new build is committed to and to try and encourage them to think about alternatives. 
um, and to really think about how, what, what is the lowest carbon route to um, solving the problem. Um, and then finally, there's a commitment to sharing best practice across the supply chain, um, again, to help others to um, move forward in, carb, in terms of carbon reduction. Because, you know, it's called a climate crisis for a reason. It really is a crisis. And we can't let competition get in the way of progress when it comes to carbon. We absolutely have to drive forward as fast as we can. So that's been a bit of a sort of lickety split run through the code. Um, what can you do next? So the first thing you can do is read the code. And as I said, there's a link in the chat. There's also a link on this slide. Um, pledge to comply or submit a compliance form. So there's two things you can do. You can say, we want to comply, but we're not quite there yet. Um, if you think you can comply, then you submit the form and the team will review it and um, you know, let you know whether your, your compliance is accepted or whether you need to be a, a pledger. Um, Organisations that are pledging or complying will be listed on the website. Um, we had a sort of soft launch back in June to give, raise, raise awareness of the code and this event is another sort of step in that direction. Um, we're going to have a formal launch aligned with the CLT activities at COP26. We're still waiting to find out quite that, what that will look like. Um, and we are planning to update the code um, as government and industry targets alter. So particularly at this early stage, if you have any comments on the code, that you think would improve it, um, there's an opportunity now because we're probably going to up issue it before COP26, so before the end of October. Um, so yeah, any, any feedback would be welcome if it's um, aimed at making the code easier to understand or applicable to you know, a wider sector of the built environment. It's intended to be broadly applicable, but we might have inadvertently used language that sort of sounds like it excludes some part of the, the built environment and, and so on. So any feedback that you have would be gratefully received. Um, the last thing I want to say is to acknowledge the input of the very many people who were part of drafting the code. Um, we spent a lot of time over about nine months batting it backwards and forwards, um, debating the, how, how ambitious it should be and so forth. Um, and in particular to thank Janet Greenwood and Keith Bowers, um, who met with me and my colleague Dee Dee Frawley back in January of 2020 before the world went pear-shaped. Um, and we had a long chat and thought we, we, we've got to do something. And we got the Achieving Net Zero group together. So um, thanks to them for kicking all of this off. And with that, um, I will say thank you very much and stop sharing my, my camera. Sorry, my screen. And uh, pass back to our chair, if I may. All right, thank you. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, and I now think we're going to get some comments from Peter Yates, uh, who's Vice Chairman of the National Association of Construction Frameworks, the NACF, and Regional Framework Director at Constructing West Midlands. Welcome, Peter. Hi, David. Hi, all, and thanks, Jennifer. Um, so um, uh, I just give a, a bit of background, really, if I may, uh, David and colleagues, uh, just to sort of kind of where we joined, we, we, we joined the, the, the group. Um, the National Association of Construction and Frameworks represents government frameworks across the, the whole of England and Wales. Uh, between us, um, NACF members deliver approximately seven billion of public sector building, civils, highways and infrastructure works per annum. Uh, we're members of the local government association and together with the LGA, Cabinet Office and Bayes colleagues, we, active, we actively partner with industry to promote best practice and help shape the future of public sector procurement. Regionally, our priorities vary according to local geography and demand. However, we share the same key objectives to build quality and affordable assets and ensure that we deliver to the social, economic and the environmental needs of our local communities. So back in, the, in early 2020, we conducted a maturity assessment across our, our members to understand the issues that were faced by local authorities. Um, many of whom I think you'll appreciate have declared climate emergencies at strategic and political level, some with um, uh, carbon reduction targets, but most uh, are still struggling to translate this into actual practical and tangible action, uh, particularly at the grassroots level. Um, so this spurred us uh, on to explore what the NACF could do to better support public sector clients to achieve their net zero obligations. In late 2020, we set up a specialist NACF carbon group and through contacts in Bayes and the Construction Leadership Council, we approached um, Cambridge and joined uh, the Achieving Net Zero group, Jennifer's group. Um, colleagues on this group uh, immediately recognised uh, the, the reach and value of our local government network 
Um, whilst at the same time, I think warm to the challenge of supporting us with, uh, I think what could be best described as the contrasting much smaller scale of projects that we typically deliver, albeit in, in, in quite a significant volume. And we agreed as a group that to make the code really work, it had to apply equally to all projects, all sectors, and all sizes of contractors, that's local SMEs and major multinationals. We believe the Carbon Reduction Code provides a scalable method to enable industry and clients to understand and measure their journey towards net zero. And to facilitate the code within our frameworks, um, we've worked in parallel to develop a new NACF key performance indicator, which we're in the process of trialling across our contractors, and importantly, uh, for them cascading it through, uh, throughout their supply chain to ensure maximum reach and impact in respect of carbon. The early feedback on the KPI has been very positive, and we intend to report back on progress of working towards the code in the coming months. Um, that's brilliant, David. Um, I'll, I'll hand over to, to, to back back to you, if I may. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, and finally, we're going to hear from Chris Hayes, who's Sustainability Operations Director at Skanska UK. Are you there, Chris? Uh, I am. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we worked with Jennifer and the and the coalition team to trial the code, help develop and trial the code from a major projects and an organisational level. And so the code's written primarily around organisations. So how did that kind of fit with a with a scheme like High Speed Two, where Skanska Costain Strabag Joint Venture are delivering Phase One of the scheme from um, from Euston out towards the M25 as part of uh, as part of that Euston to uh, to Birmingham element of the scheme. So we um, we looked at the requirements of the code, both from a contractor's perspective and a client's perspective. I worked with the HS2 Carbon team and the Skanska Costain Strabag joint venture team to carry out a gap analysis and take the opportunity to see if there are opportunities to improve our current systems, what we already had in place. As you expect, the, both the client and the joint venture are quite mature organisations. So it was a good opportunity just to see um, are we as good as we think we are? Are there opportunities to tweak and how might that um, might that structure fit with the uh, with the content of the code and how might we help define the code? And we also then considered how the code might apply to the full value chain uh, and that 50% target that we had. Um, as, you, the, as you'd expect, the code didn't really throw up any specific challenges for us. We, we worked with Jennifer and the team uh, to tweak it a little bit to fit some of the nuances of a, of a major infrastructure business and a, and a major scheme. For example, um, annual reductions um, were, were difficult for, for, a, for a big major infrastructure project in that you invest early in the capital carbon uh, and then the, um, the, the savings kind of come a bit later on. So you, you get a bit of a peak or an S curve before you get the, before you get the trough. So building that into into how the uh, the certification works was was critical for us. Um, and some of the key reflections that we had were that early engagement is key. Uh, and starting at any scheme, any major project in this way with the code and the organization alignment in mind will help deliver those low carbon outcomes that we're looking for. It, the code in itself we felt helped kept things really simple, including the measurement, quantification, reporting. And when you think about the value chain, uh, and the full value chain of, of a major scheme, it helps to demystify and open up that carbon agenda more, making it accessible to that value chain without the need of employing carbon specialists um, uh, and, and expertise that, that may add to that bottom line. And of course, also being aligned to, to the publicly available standards like the PAS just made it very simple to, um, to, to draw comparisons with uh, and align to. Uh, and I'll hand back to you, David, on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. So uh, while I'm uh, going to ask uh, Jennifer and Peter to rejoin us, let's just have a look at the poll results, which are, which are really quite interesting. 16% uh, very strong, 30%, 33% strong, 31% moderate, 19% weak and 5% don't know. Uh, that's from today's audience. Um, which from my calculation means that 49% are either strong or very strong. Does that, does that surprise you, Jennifer? It encourages me. I think um, 
what would be really interesting to see would be the extent to which those organizations therefore are measuring carbon um you know that, that i guess in a way we're, we're all on a journey together and, and we have to learn you know how to baseline our carbon emissions which isn't an easy thing to do um and then you know measure progress um and work out how we're measuring progress is it you know carbon intensity per meter squared or per occupant of a building or you know just overall for an organization so okay we're expanding but we're still going to reduce our carbon footprint in total um yeah, I think I think there's a lot for us all to learn, but it is really heartening that about half of the audience do find that they are, you know, actively involved in in carbon reduction. I guess um, uh, pollsters would be aghast at our uh, uh, academic rigor in this poll because it's, it's a self-selecting audience, uh, naturally. Um, so you would expect at least half of them would have some input, I guess, into that. But nevertheless, uh, encouraging, as you say. Um, so, so another question for you, so how does this code then differ from in initiatives like the uh, engineers declare? That's a really good question um, and something we were very aware of in drafting the code was we didn't want it to be just yet another thing that people feel they have to sign up to. Um, the difference between this and engineers declare is that um, in this we're specifically declaring our um, carbon emissions and our route to net zero um, and the idea is that this is made public and then we're also declaring that we will collaborate together so we've got some very specific measurable actions engineers declare is a fantastic thing and it has lots of good ambitions incorporated into it but it doesn't currently at least have a sort of measurable framework that um, that people can be audited against um, so this in a way was a tool for the industry at large and clients in the supply chain to sort of audit each other almost and, and work together and, and endeavour to produce measurable reductions in, in carbon emissions. Thank you. Um, Peter, coming to you, um, your, your audience today is uh, very cynical specialist contractors in the M&E world. And we'll say, yeah, there's lots of fine talk at the beginning of contracts, but actually we're about lowest cost tendering. Uh, and with carbon savings and environmental factors to sort of weigh down the priority list. So how do we get clients to, to address this issue properly when we get to the value engineering stage, shall we say, uh, when you know all those ambitions are suddenly out the window to meet the budget? Yeah, that, that's, that's a really good question. And, and if I may, David, um, just off the back of your first question there as well, uh, I mean, we're quite familiar with the contractors declare, which I think is a mirror of the engineers declare, but effectively for a different. Uh, and it was one of the reasons why we wanted to join the group, because I think what we what we'd evidenced um, was a lot of gaming of, of, of in effect, carbon to sort of score points or get reputational um, credit through it, but actually not make. Um, and, and dare I say, we, we had exactly the same in local, the local governments. I can think uh, without naming names of a particular local authority, we, we you know, that, that co-owns us that was declaring the greenest office building it had ever built um, uh, by merit of planting 20,000 trees. And we asked where, where the trees were going to be planted. And they said, we don't know, it doesn't really matter. And you kind of think, well, that's just, that's just awful. It's just greenwash. So we, we, we're, we're about the tangible. And in respect of kind of lowest cost tendering, and in parallel piece of work we're doing um, uh, with colleagues in Bayes and central government around um, the construction playbook, which we contributed towards um, through our effectiveness of frameworks document, is looking at um, something known as the, uh, the value toolkit and effectively provides, if you like, that early ready reckoner um, for contractors and their supply chain to be able to quantify and qualify those key decisions made at the earliest possible opportunity. So if you like, it, it, using Jennifer's push me pull you um, kind of analogy there, by having that early dialogue and encouraging contractors to have that early dialogue and their supply chain to have that early dialogue pushing up the chain to encourage um, clients to make some key decisions that will inform the type of build, the, the quantum of build and the types of products and the longevity of, you know, of said products will help to them then inform um, what is built in, in the round then that that effectively then becomes the measure that the client then has to go back to so what they can't just say is oh, I want the greenest building ever oh and by the way it's got to be the cheapest building ever they have something that they've got a point to they've got that, that kind of point of referral so we are from a procurement perspective putting those checks and balances in but it's something that um, central government is, is, is really strong on really leading on and so I suppose the assurance we're trying to give to our SME providers and the, and, and the big thing about us uh, within the NACF is 
we are regional, we are, for want of a better expression, desperately parochial, we are about our communities, we are about our regions, because frankly, the, the SMEs that are in our regions are our taxpayers, they vote for um, you know, our council elected members. So it's this kind of cyclical economy that we're sort of supporting here. And in respect to making sure that they are supported and they thrive, um, it, it, it comes back to that kind of um, the three tenets of sustainability. It's got to be economic, social and environmental, but all kind of glued together. And sadly, for far too long, we've kind of just um, we've classed that kind of environmental aspect as just an add on. And I think now we're seeing that, um, I do you know what, uh, we're getting a taste of democratising that, but also commercialising that environmental bit, because for those detractors, and we did have a number of them on this journey, so said, well, you know, what's the point of, you know, I'm just a low turnover business, what's the point of me adding, um, you know, really looking at um, decarbonising or, or addressing carbon emissions? And in respect to what that, uh, we, we turn around to them and sort of said, well, if we carry out procurement exercises, where our selection criteria are based on not just lowest cost, but some qualitative criteria around your route to net zero, and that's cascaded throughout the supply chain, and you can win more work because of that. And as I say, we, we, are, we are a microcosm of uh, LGA and public sector, but the seven billion that we put through each year, it's, it's a reasonable spend. Then hopefully we start to sort of um, commercialize that. And forgive me for, for, for jumping on a pedestal, Dave, but it kind of, um, it, the analogy we used at the, at the group was, um, uh, and some of our, um, uh, our colleagues on this call may recognise it, certainly from a contracting background, is Construction News started a poll um, a few years back around uh, fair payment and practice, and it was a bit of a novelty at the time. My God, it's become a really serious annual event now for those contractors who pay on time and, and, and can get themselves up that list. And I know of the majority of our National Procurement Strategy Group um, procurement officers who will use that as a measure of how good or how ethical a contractor performs. So um, it, it's become, you know, it's become a commercialized product and we hope to do the same if necessary with carbon. We would like, of course, to encourage and cajole uh, contractors to want to do this. Um, but if they want to do that and they're part of this story, um, I think we can reward them. Um, and I think that's really going to be our approach going forward. Uh, thank you. I, I always thought clients wanted to win the Sterling Prize uh, to kick off with them until they've discovered they couldn't actually afford the uh, Sterling Prize. So, Chris, oh, David, I'm, David, I'm an architect by background, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that, but I'll, but I'll shut up uh, given the yeah. amount of engineers on the, on the call. <laughs> yeah, then it looks like a Tesco supermarket by the end of it. Uh, Chris, for your, your Scanska ranks as a Tier 1, Tier 2 contractor, um, how does it look from your perspective that, that that same angle about you know it's all well and good till we get to the price how do you approach that as Skanska? Uh, well we don't build Tesco supermarkets or any other supermarkets. I said they look like them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we take the view uh, and uh, you know based on based on factor realism based on good quality data based on looking back over 10 years of what we've done and measuring that to, to arrive at a position where you know, we think that you can have your cake and eat it. You can have the most advantageous, most advantageous uh, tender. You can have a, a lowest cost. If you treat cost and carbon as equal outcomes in that whole development cycle of a scheme from, from that conceptual, beautifully drawn um, impossible to build um, architect's dream on paper uh, and where it is, all the way through to the value engineered um, something that isn't quite a box and is very, very functional that, that we deliver on site. If you take cost and carbon equally through that and take that Totex view, what you end up with is a low cost, low carbon outcome. And that's true probably for 80% of that, of that sequencing. It's only when you get down to where contractors and, and the tier twos tier threes normally get involved in uh, that um okay we've designed it it looks like this this is what it's going to do you need to go and find me some low carbon materials well at that point it's too late and those low carbon materials currently tend to come at a little bit of a premium but the, the majority of the savings the majority of the carbon reduction the majority of this journey can be done with cost and carbon in mind and as, as equal partners and as an equal outcome uh, and we're applying that in, in how we how we budget how we cost how we design now um and, and it was part of the the ses jv winning uh, bid for, for high speed two for, for the eastern tunnel sections so you can have your cake and eat it you can have low cost and low carbon to a degree you need to be inclusive we need to bring the supply chain with us 
the supply chain have expertise that the tier ones don't have and the clients have. So that integrated collaborative approach to solving that cost carbon challenge is critical to getting this right. And something like the code and getting people signed up and getting everybody um, around the table and moving in, in the same direction committed to that carbon reduction will we'll just accelerate that change. So, so you talk about TOTEX, so total expenditure, as opposed to CAPEX and OPEX. Ought we be, ought we be engaging with the accountancy profession saying actually the way we accountants, the finance directors account for this actually is a, is a barrier to getting long-term whole life investment carried out? Uh, it, it can be, absolutely. And that starts right at the very top. If you think about Treasury in the Green Book and, and where they apply value to, to certain measures for, for development and you know, the economic benefit it will bring to a community balanced against the environmental um, implications and costs. Uh, my personal opinion is carbon isn't, or carbon equivalent emissions, still currently outweighted strong enough in that in that measure, performance measures of whether a scheme stops and goes. Um, I still think we need infrastructure, we need new infrastructure to open up a development and to move people around, but also the right kind of infrastructure in the right kind of place. Um, but how you account for it and how you measure it, it is hit and miss up and down, up and down the industry. I think the, speaking from an infrastructure um, background, and most recently, we are starting to see that whole life, um, a whole life message start to come through, especially when you think about trains and, and cars and, and transport systems and the, the emissions associated with the user being the being the massive like 95 percent of the carbon that's invested. But as you as you create policies to move to EV or to hydrogen or whatever the solution is, that capital investment up front, so the amount of concrete and steel that's required starts to play a much bigger part of the equation, starts to become much more relevant and therefore starts to get measured better. Uh, Jennifer, we, we heard um, an awful lot when President Trump was in power about actually it didn't matter what government did because companies on their own were, were taking huge strides in uh, driving the, the reduction in carbon. Do you see ESG, environmental, social and governance factors for funders becoming the major part of this or does it really have to come from government in terms of legal and policy change? I think it has to be both. Um, I think individual organisations and the pressure that's put on them by, by funders through the, the ESG factors are really important. You know, we all have to do what we can. I think the challenge is, particularly when it comes to the built environment, as I said earlier in my slides, you know, it is a system of systems. Um, and if we don't treat it as a system of systems, then it becomes a bit like a game of whack-a-mole. You know, you push down in one place, but it pops up somewhere else. Um, so, and that's where we need the government to step in and help sort of do that, if you like, that coordination, um, both at a, an individual infrastructure systems level and then between infrastructure systems. Um, you know, you think about examples like um, water and energy, um, the, the wastewater industry uses a lot of energy, but they actually also have an energy resource there. And, and are we making the most of being able to bring together the sort of the energy supply side of that, if you like, with the energy use side of that? Um, so we, we need to really think about these things at, at a systems level and then a system systems level. And that's true, you know, when we're designing a building, for example, and we're thinking about what does its you know what, what does its structure look like and do we go for a lightweight structure to save embodied carbon or do we go for a, a heavier weight structure which may or may not be more carbon intensive um, to, to manage the, the thermal performance of the building for example versus the heating and cooling systems that we install um, and how do we make all of that work together with the occupants because I think that's the other critical thing often you know we engineers like to design solutions but we don't always think about the users and how they're going to actually interface with things um so you know we need to think about how these systems work in the whole including with the people who you know the, the individual humans who are using them um and how we can encourage carbon reduction so it's about reducing demand and then addressing supply um and, and you know again if you're building a building I, I personally think that you know every big shed should be forced to have PV on the roof because it's massive space and why not why not use it? Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case at the moment. There may well be good reasons not to. But um, 
you know, the more we can think about the whole system rather than just, you know, I'm a structural engineer, I'm putting in columns, I'm an m and &E engineer, I'm putting in cabling, I'm, a, I'm an energy provider, I'm, I'm providing electrons or whatever, um, then that helps the, the, the societal move towards lower carbon. Uh, your point about every building, every warehouse should have PV on the roof. The, the slight problem with that is that they'll put PV on the roof, but nobody will check if it works. Yeah. It's irrelevant whether it works, you've ticked the box. We assemble products, not systems, mm. uh, and don't treat the building as a product. So I was going to come on to, to Peter and Chris about how do we ensure we hold people's feet to the flames? It's not much of an ask to ask a developer to actually just build it to building regulations. That would be a start, wouldn't it? How do we how do we achieve that? Because at the moment, enforcement is, well, there is no enforcement, is there? Do you mind if I start, Peter, and come to you? Thank you. Um, so th there's, a, there's a few threads here. Um, the, there's the what drives a developer to make decisions. Um, Skanska developed, we developed our own facilities up in Bentley Road, Stonecast from London. Uh, and if you take the kind of uh, developer occupier led approach, you tend to end up with the making sure that the PV works that you put on the, on the roof. And, you know, we did a full cost benefit analysis to to work out what the extra additional investment to get that to a net zero carbon building would be and how long it would pay back and that went into the the financing of the scheme now if you're a developer that is just building and flipping and you know i'm building an office space now and i'm going to occupy it and sell it i have no vested interest other than the premium a green building might bring me then there might be less scrutiny on, on the quality but probably not I, you know I, I think most people will make sure that they've got a good quality product before they sign that final check um, but in terms of holding people's feet to the fire, I think one of the critical things that we haven't discussed, if you take regulation out of this, is um, the skills that are needed to allow people to scrutinise and hold people's feet to the fire. Uh, and if you look at um, if you look at building control, if you look at uh, the the authority side of that, um, never mind the, the skills challenge that we have within the within our industries, but on on the on the authority side of that. Um, you know who's training the who's training the building control officer to validate and verify net zero carbon building, or that the PV is going to produce the carbon reductions that were committed to in the local plans. You know that there is a there is a skills challenge there, not just for ourselves and for the, the building services, building engineering um, fraternity, but also for the uh, for the regulatory side, for the for the um, for the architects, for the contractors, to make sure that if we all want the same outcome, we're all actually enabled to deliver that outcome. And there's a little bit of a skills investment required, I think, across the whole board. And, and Peter? Yeah, and um, I, I, I suppose I should uh, declare as well, David, I'm co-deputy chair, chair of the um, industry response group, um, competence steering group that was uh, signed the professional technical representative for the LGA at the Grenfell Hackett work. So in respect of, um, I suppose, it, if Chris is answering it from a, if you like a contractor's delivery perspective, I'm probably answering it from a client's um, a client's perspective, you know, a building owner's perspective. Um, we have 330 local authorities in the LGA, and um, I don't think we've got a straight answer for you, if I'm honest, because what we've seen, if you like, if we use the analog of safety in uh, in the industry, and the, the I think the over reliance uh, from government's perspective on industry sorting it out. Um, and the over reliance from certainly from a local government uh, public sector perspective on there being sufficient checks and balances in place, there simply isn't. Um, and you know, it's a complete misnomer to think the building control um, inspects on quality. They don't. They, they you know they, they inspect on the um, uh, 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 to the building regs, and they are finite. And frankly, they are the minimum standard. They are minimum legal standard in the UK. And there is a significant gap between. What the building regs say and what is a good functioning quality building uh, or quality system um, uh, uh, you know dear to, to said building and i think frankly um, as an industry the way we've gone contractually the way um, we've kind of adopted lean routes over the years um, has seen off a host of um, those particular um, trade specialist experts um, i mean for us within local governments um, uh, we, we have a, an absolute minority of what's known as Clark, Clarker works for, for those who can still remember them. And yet it was a well-recognised and, and uh, 
very valuable profession. Um, the majority are within spitting distance of their retirement now. We've spoken to the likes of the ICWCI uh, about trying to bring in specialists. We used to have, I mean, I, I'm aligned with Birmingham City Council, which you'll appreciate quite a, a sizable local authority, uh, um, the largest in, 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 you know, in Western Europe. So in respect to that, we have, I think we've got six clerk works, whereas we used to have teams of them and we used to have specialists in M, specialists in E, specialists in structural, uh, those sub-specialists within the structural who just did concrete. I mean, you know, crikey, there was, uh, a, a, and, and they would be experts in the ability to, be able to sign off and, um, and, and verify, validate buildings. We don't have them. The reliance is on uh, DMB type contracts, on uh, allowing, uh, on, on assuming the contractor has the knowledge. And I've got some time for this because frankly, if you employ a solicitor, you don't employ another solicitor to go and check their work. There has to be an expectation um, that when we employ experts at cost, they deliver. Um, but sadly, and, and I use the analogy again with things like Grenfell and some of the accidents that have happened since, that, that you, we've proven you can't always trust industry. And, and David, I completely concur with that. We went through the Green Deal um, in Birmingham. We were an early adopter and we stuck PVs on, on bloody everything without any kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, understanding as to what the uh, uh, requirements would be from for maintenance. And once the... Um, you know, once the diverters started packing up and they were kind of short lived uh, in initially, um, uh, we had some horrible accidents from those who weren't properly trained to get on a roof and deal with DC voltage. So um, I, I think there was a gap in industry. And I think, again, for those in the supply chain, those in, the, in those expert uh, fields have got a really marketable. Uh, if I use the, again, the analog with the kind of safety uh, uh, regime, Fire officers are rare as hen's teeth and an incredibly valuable commodity at the moment. And I think it will come the same for those in the kind of the carbon sectors, the ability to be able to sign off independent, independent third party verification is what we look for um, in, in, in public sector. Uh, Jennifer, do you have any concerns? Uh, uh, Peter was mentioning about the Hackett review and uh, the, uh, the outfall from Grenfell. Have any concerns over the Building Safety Act and that that will drive a culture of building buildings safe? Uh, a focus on safety rather than anything else? I think there is potential for that, but I think there's also potential for the response to the Hackett Review to enable better practice. Because I think, you know, when you look at what happened at Grenfell, pretty much everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And a lot of that was down to, you know, no one set out to build a, a structure that was going to go off in flames. They might have set out to kind of get away with what they could in terms of cost and that kind of thing but a lot of it was down to not having enough sight both backwards and forwards in the sort of activity chain if you like of that retrofit to understand the role that your your part of it played in keeping that building fire safe so the move to sort of digital compliance um, and the ability to track data i think will help a lot um obviously with the, the, the safety compliance but it also then helps you to track data around carbon and materials use and so forth, um, because essentially it's the same information. Um, and once you've set up a system um, to help you manage um, data for demonstrating compliance with the sort of building safety side of, of things, you can use that system for a number of other things. So it will, it will create a digital familiarity, if you like, you know, sort of building on the back almost of what's happened with COVID, we're all now, we're all on this um, webinar together you know, we think nothing of going into Zoom or Teams meetings or what have you. Um, it will build a, a digital familiarity, I think, that will then be really helpful um, in actually helping us to measure and monitor and track carbon use. There is the issue that people will think, well, we just need to throw more at it. But I think the fact of the matter is there was not an under-design issue at Grenfell and there is not an under-design issue in pretty much anything we do. In fact, there's a massive over-design issue. The problem is around the quality of, of delivery making sure that you know joints fit together right all that kind of stuff to make sure that if we if we reduce the amount of material in a, in a building as an example or in a bridge or what have you um that it's still capable of performing the, the sort of physically to what it needs to. it's the same if you're designing electrical product you know um <clears throat> we need to make sure that we understand the requirements of designing them manufacturing them and as peter was pointing out using them um but the, the more that we are competent in that in one area, hopefully that will help us build competence in other areas as well. David, if I, if I, if I may um, just, just add to that, it, it, you ask a very interesting question, and it's a question that was posed to the ISSG team, to, to Dame Judith and others, 
because if you like the, the knee jerk reaction to something like the thermal um, the thermal regs part L was to go and wrap buildings in frankly what you know on, on paper was probably the best thing you could wrap a building is you know a, a petrochemical hydrocarbon you know doesn't absorb water but it only satisfies the thermal regs i think people forgot that the thing it burns like bilio and actually wrapping a building in it is probably not the most common sense thing but there was a knee-jerk reaction we sat at these sessions where actually well what we should be doing is completely reducing um, air movement in buildings locking them down into compartments reducing natural ventilation and um, natural daylight because uh, any any openings anywhere are, are going to you know, compromise a building's fire integrity and its compartmentation and we, we push back as you know as, uh, as local government association and as a group to say hang on you have to consider this in the round so i can compare i concur with your question it's a really good one but there is a real danger we'll go knee-jerk on, on some of these things i think you have to look at the broader but i i, I mean um, jennifer mentioned something and it's something that has been echoed in dame judith's word which is the a building is a system of systems and the ability to be able to connect um, early key decision making by you know at inception stage what, what the client is, is asking for with what the design consultants and the specialist engineering teams are designing with what the contractors are delivering with what their supply chain is supplying and frankly how the end user is using it all needs to be a part of a connected story you know to describe as the golden chain uh, the golden thread and i think that's that that's really essential in, in terms of re reviewing a number of these factors Thank you, Peter. So I, I can't believe the time has flown by. Um, but so a final question, which is um, we have a, a very diverse audience uh, here, but, but the majority probably mechanical electrical contractors who are either tier two or tier three, uh, and probably a lot of them are wondering, as I am, how do I get started? How do I, I want to participate, I want to get involved. Where do I start? Uh, can I start with Jennifer? So from a code perspective, um, do go and have a look at the website, read the code, um, get in touch with us if you're interested in pledging to try and comply with the code, or indeed if you think you're able to comply with the code. But also get in touch with us if you look at it and you think, I can't comply with this because it's sort of structurally inappropriate for what I do, because we really need to hear that if that's the case. We, we think and we hope that we have, you know, through the work that Peter and his colleagues have done, looked at all these aspects, but we might have missed something. So Kind of help us shape it um, but also we're thinking of setting up some sort of early adopters groups so if there's enough interest in that then um, we can sort of set up some some groups to work through together how they're going to comply with the code we'll, we'll be very happy to help facilitate that i think it's something that, that we can bring people together to uh, to do that um, because you can be sure there won't be just one person there thinking this chris what, what's your view on that um so not to repeat Jennifer, which um, is a perfect answer, of course, um, but to uh, get involved in the associations, get involved in the groups, um, you know, that kind of power of, of the tier threes together pushing up um, will carry more weight than, than lots of individual voices. Uh, there's lots of opportunities to do that around our industry, uh, but also reference back to the, to the safety point from earlier. Um, safety has got to where it is because it's been made, per been made personal to people. Uh, the, the same for, for this carbon agenda. If you really want to know what you can do, start at home and think about what you can do and then take that into your work life. I, I put out a tweet this morning saying uh, it's not just your children are going to, going to ask you what you do. It's uh, actually people like you. So I'm presuming that Scanska will be asking more and more detailed questions about what are you doing to get to net zero? Uh, absolutely. Without, without making it overly complicated. Got it has to be Thank you. And finally, Peter. Yeah, and, and I suppose, uh, again, if I was to just, um, for, for those um, colleagues um, on the call that, that, that do deliver any kind of public sector or in particular local government work, um, uh, and, and, in, and in the absolute spirit of being overly bureaucratic within local government, we will, we will push it through the supply chains. Um, we already have it in our procurement um, uh, 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 and tender documentation. But instead of just stopping at tier one and expecting, frankly, just, you know, I mean, prime contractors who are facilitators um, to sort of just 
you know, um, repeat back to us their corporate policy, we have an expectation that that then actually gets physically cascaded. And one of the relationships that's very strong in local government is with the Supply Chain Sustainability School. We've encouraged contractors and a host of them, the blue chip um, prime contractors have said, well, we've got this brilliant net zero, we're already net zero, we've got this great corporate policy. And then when you ask the question, so what are you doing about your supply chain? The questions don't, the answers don't come, come back quite so fast. So we're asking them to really, uh, I, I think um, I think the first stage of what we will be doing uh, will be really pushing that communication drive, that ability to, to drive through toolbox talks for, uh, you know, the man or woman in the van kind of operations, the small operators, the SMEs, that frankly comes back to what we are set up to do, which is serve our local communities. And we will want to, we will encourage that kind of iterative conversation for those entities, uh, I mean, dare I say, through Beza, David, to come to us and say, do you know what, we're working on this, but we, we never get involved in these discussions. We want to know because, uh, you know, the book doesn't stop at the prime contractor and us having a conversation. It, 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 you know, if you take that analogue of, um, a, you know, a major project, something 20 percent of the spend sits, sits there at the kind of the, the, the tier one, but 80, 80 odd percent of it is actually delivered by the multiple tiers that sit underneath of it. And if that analog is similar in terms of the impact in terms of the products, uh, the designed um, uh, capability uh, and efficiency of said products, then that's what we really want to tackle. Yeah, yeah, we're the doers as opposed to the yeah. non-doers, they said. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Jennifer Schooling, Chris Hayes, Gates and uh, PDA, sorry, PDAs and Chris Hayes, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch because we really want to get involved. So thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Alex. Pleasure, pleasure. Uh, if you enjoyed today, uh, come and see us again on the 21st. We're doing closing the skills gap uh, in the building engineering services sector. If you want to be able to get to uh, Net Zero Nero in stores, then uh, you probably probably better listen to that one. And we've also got our conference coming up, which is an online two-day event, 3rd and 4th of November, some great, great speakers, uh, and building back better, safer, greener. Uh, that's it for today. Thank you very much. We'll see you again shortly. Thank you finally again to our guests, and uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Are we done, Charlie?